Good afternoon and welcome to another Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to be joined by Ben Stock of Order and Matt Domino of First Health Advisory. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Order. Order is focused on making connected device secure, simple, security simple through our zero touch agentless deployment. One common platform for multiple stakeholders and automation of policies to secure devices. With order, you will know exactly what's connected to the network in real time, all the time. You will know what's vulnerable, what's behaving maliciously and why, and you can then automate response for any connected device and enforce on any networking and security infrastructure. We want to encourage all of our attendees to learn more about today's sponsor by visiting their website, which is order.net. That's O-R-D-R dot net. Quick reminder to the attendees that MD Expo is headed to Temecula Valley's Pachango Casino Resort, October 11 through 13. Registration is open online right now at mdexposhow.com. And you can use the VIP code 22MDESOCAL at checkout to receive complimentary admission to this three-day conference. As a note, the VIP code is available to individuals employed with a hospital, healthcare facility, or are active military or students. Today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's presentation, and you'll be able to download your certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions or challenges, you can always reach the webinar team at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, Order Director of Healthcare Product Management, Ben Stock, and First Health Advisory, EVP, and CSO of Clinical and Operational Technology, Matt Domino, are our presenters, and will share best practices from years of working with leading healthcare delivery organizations. They will discuss a healthcare security maturity model, a framework for creating a medical device security program, coupled with technology that can accelerate the move towards a secure, connected healthcare environment. We are going to wrap up today's webinar with a live Q&A, so be sure to submit your questions at any time using the question feature on your webinar dashboard. All right, Matt, you may begin whenever you're ready. Right, thank you, Jamie. All right, so we're rolling a little bit more about me. As Jamie mentioned, I'm the EVP and CSO here at, at First Health Advisory. Um, being partner with Order, so one of our, our key you know, elements that First Health Advisory offers and myself is programs around medical device security. So we have you know, a backed experience um, in HCM, clinical engineering and biomed for many, many years, developing programs and security offerings around medical device security. And again, part of that is, is risk assessments and, and understanding your architecture and helping again build frameworks. Um, and then a little bit more about me, I've, I've been an instructor at IUPUI in Indianapolis for about 10 years, mostly teaching biomedical engineering technology and, and other I, IT and IS type technologies as well. So with that, Ben? Thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, ben Stock, uh, I've been doing this for coming on 20 years now. Uh, I've been the last two years with Order. Uh, I started out as a, an accidental biomed BMET 1 and uh, worked my way up through uh, SSM Health out of St. Louis, Missouri, and absolutely love uh, the, the career choice of being a biomedical engineer uh, and where it's taken me in life and uh, working with our, our partners uh, like First Health Advisors. Uh, Order is, is the platform, but uh, First Health provides the the, the people and the, the the processes that help us succeed, uh, and we'll look at that as, as Matt continues. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so a quick synopsis. I, I think Ben really nailed it here, right? The, the goal is, is people, process, and technology, and, and so what we really want to do is, is try to highlight those elements when it comes to developing any kind of medical device security program and any kind of efficiencies around your organization and, and with your data. And, and really focusing on, again, you know, your technology debt and managing life cycle of your assets. And so really today what we want to focus on is some basic tactics and practices 
and strategies around that lifecycle management. So utilizing, you know, order data, utilizing these, this kind of data to really help you make actionable decisions. And these actionable decisions will kind of help drive some of your technology debt, you know, help drive some of the replacement capabilities. And again, you know, being able to keep that foundation to, to a program. Another element to this is we want you to understand, you know, there's a maturity model associated with this. There's, there's more than just nuts and bolts to anything medical device security related. So there's a lot of roadmap elements, there's, there's strategy, there's alignment and value delivery, and there's, there's other people in your organization that need to be associated with any kind of plans and offerings that you are looking to do. Another piece is we wanna learn, you know, some st strategic alignment, and again, how to maximize some efficiencies and, and, and kind of gain traction and control over what you're trying to accomplish. Anything that, that you kind of build that's more of an ad hoc process really isn't going to get some, some backing from sponsors. So you have to almost build your own business case. You have to work with other stakeholders. You have to identify the challenge and how you're gonna solve that challenge. And so you kind of have to learn how to, to build some of this information and build, put it together to be able to convey that message to your leaders. Um, another thing we want to do is we want to define risk management. It, you know, this is an iterative approach. This is an, absolutely not a one and done. There's no, you know, check the box and we'll move on. So it's a constant continuing cycle that we'll kind of identify and, and, and we'll discuss many of the elements that are associated with that. And again, once you have that iterative process in place, you'll begin to see the efficiencies and you'll begin to support those life cycle initiatives. Uh, so one of the first things we, we just want to come out talking about is just some basic proven tactics and strategies. You know, there, there's a lot of, you know, methodologies behind this. And what this ultimately boils down to and breaks down to in many cases is, you know, having a maturity understanding and, a, and, and utilizing a framework. And I'll, I'll cover some of the framework elements and the foundations here in just a moment. But what I want to share is, you know, break everything down into small measurable pieces. You can't, you know, don't bite it off in one chunk. It's what is my goal, what am I trying to accomplish, and how do I make sure that's one small measurable piece. We also want to prioritize phases and track the level of effort. Uh, what I'll share is in, in biomed, HTM, clinical engineering, around the board is we, we don't track very well. We don't manage the, the people and, and the things that we're doing very well because we're, we're focused on PMs and CMs, and we don't always focus on the level of effort we might be putting forth with a program. So we really want to look at those phases. We want to track what we're trying to accomplish, create work orders, and, and again, track the time and level of effort, because that's all justification down the road for FTEs and other elements that you may need. Uh, I, I mentioned understand your maturity. Uh, this, is, this is critical, really, to just understand where you stand. And that's kind of what you see here in this diagram is a maturity map, essentially. You know, where do I stand today? Where could I be three to six months from now? And, and really, where would I be in five months? And what would it take to get there? And you can see the different layers here of the technology in the gray, the process kind of in the blue, and I guess call it teal or, or turquoise or green, and is the people. And, and again, you have to stack these elements together because there's no one single element that checks all boxes. So making sure when you have technology like order, you have somebody to run it. You have somebody that's going to utilize it on a regular basis. And so, you know, this, this again, this maturity model isn't really specific to any one group. It's here for you to visualize, but for the most part is if you can determine where you stand today, and again, where you wanna be, you can measure this, you can define this, and then what you could ultimately do is associate um, time and effort with each one of these models. So where do I wanna be? I wanna be a three. Well, what's it gonna take me to be a three, and what's it gonna cost me? Um, so being able to build out these, these processes and, and kind of associate that with each phase will help you help you get there, really. Um, I mentioned it, it's okay. It's okay to go after a quick win, right? So, so you, you want to start a program, you want to do something with medical device security, and just going after something right away, that's okay. But if you continue to just chase easy targets, you'll quickly become inefficient. You kind of lose focus. You won't be able to stick to this. You won't be able to stick to your your strategy, and you're going to start chasing things that are real relevant. Um, I've already mentioned, right? A complete solution is people, process, and technology, and we'll re reiterate that throughout. Um, I'll say this, you know, you, you've got to document everything you do, you know, with, with all these folks that we're training, with folks that you might be training, maybe, you know, you're, you're going through some form of training program now, or you're getting some sort of cybersecurity training, um, people disappear, people leave for other things. And so if you don't document what you're doing, uh, it, it's gone. You know, if, it, if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. And I'll cover a little more of that throughout, but that's a good 
good key element to have in place is when you hire somebody and you're working towards a program or a process, once you figure out what's working for you, put it on paper, make it measurable, and that way, if something happens, you can you can repeat some some of what you accomplished. Uh, and then, you know, healthcare technology debt is inevitable, so you must plan for it. So biomed, clinical engineering, you know, granted, sometimes capital equipment planning isn't in your domain, and it may fall under supply chain or other departments, but it's inevitable. It will come back to you at some point in time. You're going to have input at some point in time. And what I'll share is, is you know, utilizing information from a, a platform or a product and utilizing the data that maybe order provides you is, is could be critical to you helping make those decisions to persuade individuals or to build your business case on getting out of that technology debt and replacing some of your, your critical assets here. Thanks, Matt. And, uh, the point of technology debt, I think, is a big one because as clinical engineering for the years, we've, we've, we've under, understood life cycle management. Um, you know, equipment comes, it, it gets used for a period of time, and then it, and then it needs to be replaced. Uh, I think what caught us off guard with technology debt is the fact that it needs to be replaced quicker. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with things with operating systems that become outdated, um, and we didn't adjust quick enough for that debt. And not only did we not adjust quick enough, but we're still buying equipment that has technology debt already built into it before it hits the floor and is used. Um, so we really have to look at it in a, in a two-pronged approach. One is, you know, dealing with the technology that we have, but then also the other one is to stop the hemorrhaging of the technology debt that we're acquiring uh, and make sure that we're making smart purchase decisions, coming back to that capital management, um, that the equipment we're buying is going to last a while and we do have an upgrade path for it. Perfect point, Ben, and we'll cover some of those elements from a life cycle perspective and, and how you can participate in that approach. Uh, so as mentioned, foundations first, right? So medical device security is a team sport, uh, and I'll share, there's no way, shape, or form you will win if you're going at it solo or ad hoc, uh, meaning if you don't get senior sponsorship, executive buy-in, whether it's your, your, your chief information officer, your CIO, or your, your chief information security officer, your CISO, or someone from the C-suite who's saying, yes, that's a great idea. We really need to focus on this. Uh, it becomes a challenge. You're, you're not gonna get the buy-in. You're not gonna be able to do the things you need or want to do. And you know, so those individuals have to help, like I said, sponsor. They don't have to participate in the tactical and, and everyday elements, but just having their buy-in, having an understanding of what we're trying to accomplish and provide you resourcing is, is really critical for, for this kind of as a foundational element. And when you do, you finally get buy-in. Now, now you start to identify kind of a, a charter or a group, if you will, right? Hate to call it another committee in healthcare, but that's kind of what it is. You know, getting those, those stakeholders together. Um, there's value across the board in, in trying to accomplish of what we're talking about today and what we're talking about throughout you know, medical device security is, is defining tactical leads or your, your, your other strategic leads. You know, those individuals who might be frontline and those individuals who may be those who have to report back to the C-suite. So there's there's different roles within this that we have to define. And, and again, that's a good foundation. You know, just hiring an individual, just hiring an HTM, biomed, clinical engineering, you know, cybersecurity analyst, that's a fantastic start. But it, it's not part of the foundation, right? You need to get support and buy-in, and then they'll help provide some of that direction on what this analyst should be doing. Um, a strategy and a, and a roadmap. I, I see this across the board. So many organizations forget about it, right? And they, they go, they buy something, and then, you know, it's, it's great technology, and they just haven't put it all together, or they haven't intertwined it with their current technology stack. They haven't learned how to uh, manage it with people. So realizing that, well, it's another security tool, maybe I'll put it in with the security group, and then realizing that, well, this, is, this tool provides so much value that there's numerous stakeholders that need to be involved in this. Uh, so that strategy and that roadmap really have to pertain here. And it doesn't have to be descriptive and prescriptive, right? It just just enough to say, where are we go again, where are we going? Where do we want to be? And how do we get there? And what are the pieces of that? Uh, I've already mentioned, you know, you define your current state and, and what's your future state? You know, where do you want to be and how are you going to get there? And those are all critical elements here. And, and one that I, I find a lot of organizations just overlook or, or may not look at at all and, and, and struggle with is, you know, using a framework as your guidelines. So the NIST cybersecurity framework, and oftentimes it, it's not in the purview of biomed clinical engineering, it, it's more of a cyber IT kind of framework, but it aligns very well to what we're trying to accomplish. And that's what you see here in this diagram off to the right is, you know, some core functions and core categories. Now, absolutely not, not everything maps over into clinical engineering and I won't tell you everything does. 
but there's a good portion of this that does map into clinical engineering or HTM. And so you, from a, you know, trying to create a program and create efficiencies, being able to map what you're doing, your processes, your procedures of medical device security over to this framework is, is critical for your sponsors, critical for your organization. And the reason why is in many cases, cyber insurance, um, you know, the, um, other HIPAA and, and OCR sanctions are tied back to frameworks. So there's a lot of elements to this where if you can prove and vet what you're doing is mapped to you know, maybe the 405D MITRE or, or again, the NIST cybersecurity framework, then you're in good position to withstand any kind of uh, premiums or, or, or not, you know, not even be able to acquire cyber insurance, which we're seeing more and more of today. Again, cyber insurance may not be within your domain, but when, you can, when you're responsible and accountable for some of these assets, being able to map to it is really helpful to, to your sponsor. And Matt, it's a great point about sponsors, and and sometimes they can be hard to get. And and I hate to to be this way, but when you are, we all as biomeds, we always have that one thing that shows up that it hasn't gone through the right processes, and and it's a it's a chore to get it through the the correct security uh, and IT processes to get it on the network and up and running. And usually, you're getting a lot, especially if it's a very expensive piece of equipment, a lot of heat from leadership on why this isn't up and running yet. Um, don't let those opportunities go to waste. Don't delay what you're doing, but make sure that as part of the conversation, uh, let them know you have options and, and you think there's opportunities to improve the process so these things don't happen in the future and plant those seeds uh, and set up times in the future after it's resolved to talk to them about what can be done so these things don't happen again. Uh, it really helps build that, that partnership uh, from, from the top down uh, so that you know you're getting the right people involved. Very good. Uh, and so still focusing on these foundations, you know, we're, we're kind of evaluate your current workflows. Do they make sense? Do they even exist? Uh, if, if it's not documented, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't exist. You know, I, I do audits, I do assessments. And when we come in and we have conversations with, with different folks, they may do it in, a, in an email, right? They, they may do it in this undocumented, uncharted territories. But if you can't prove it, it, it doesn't really exist. And, and as mentioned, if, if someone decides they're going to take off and go somewhere else or you know, something happens, there's, there's no documentation. There's no ability to re, you know, reiterate that or, or you know, rebuild from that. So you know, always, whatever you've got going on, make sure you've got some workflows built to it. And if it's documented and you don't follow it, what's the point, right? Uh, if you've got it, but no one's following it, it it's, it's no good for you. So obviously something needs to change and we need to start looking at some policies and things like that. Uh, align your priorities with what I'll call IS or cyber or, or GRC, governance, risk, and compliance. You know, are, are, do they have SLAs? Do they have expectations? And, and this is really, I hate to call the turf war, but this is what we see in some instances where, you know, you're not coming to the party or they're not coming to the party and you're not communicating. So they may assume you're doing something and you may assume they're doing something, but in reality, maybe neither one of you are doing anything because there's a lack of understanding. And that kind of boils back to the sponsorship, and getting a, a group or a charter together and to have those conversations. Uh, what I see in some more mature organizations is the IS cyber team have SLAs. They have expectations of you, and you may not be aware of those expectations. For instance, uh, patching is a good one. Uh, do you, do, you know, what, how, how quickly are you going to patch this vulnerability? I don't, right? I don't know. If, it, if you know, I don't read the cyber policies. I'm not aware of your policies. And they're saying, well, they're, they're organizational policies. Why aren't you reading them? I see that on a regular basis. So again, make sure you align. Whatever they got going on, um, you know, meet those expectations, but then share realistic boundaries and expectations. Like, hey, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of medical devices don't allow you to patch or they don't provide you patching information in an appropriate time frame, right? Three months, six months, three years. We're all aware of that by now. Uh, they aren't. Uh, they often don't know and they often don't care. So you have to be able to shed light on that and share with them why. And then, you know, come through to an exception or acceptance process with them. It'll finally kind of break down that, that barrier a little bit. Uh, support business objectives, okay? Again, optimize what you have. What you have isn't always bad. What you have isn't always outdated. Some of it may be. But if you've got technology, you've got CMMSs, you've got other elements there, Optimize those investments, see what they can do for you. And a great example is, is you know, integrating your, your CMMS with a tool like Order, right? So, so Order is going to provide you some efficiencies. Your CMMS is more of a static product that, that requires some, some input from your team. 
you know, if you can merge that, those two data characteristics together, or those attributes, you know, now you can start to optimize your investments between your, your people and your process and your technology. That's just kind of one example there. As mentioned, focus on a program, a complete iterative program. You know, to have success, it's documented, it's charted, it's iterative. If, if someone jumps out, you can put someone back in and, and the process keeps going. You don't have to stop everything just because an individual is, is not participating. And, and that's exactly what I'm seeing you know, across the board today is just too much focus on one role or one person and, and you're not doing the right thing. And, and you know, I'll, I'll head on this pretty hard is adding a, a cyber staff member, an HTM cybersecurity analyst, and just chasing vulnerabilities is absolutely not a program. It's a good start. It, it's, you're moving the needle, you're doing something, but what often happens is, is there's no clear boundaries, there's no clear roles and responsibilities. You just kind of give that individual access and you say, here, go chasing. Um, and, and so without that focus, without a program, it becomes unclear and, and it becomes a never ending cycle. And as mentioned, plan and evaluate for technology debt. Start to incorporate the data you're gonna see from these IOMT tools. You know, start to incorporate that information because for years, we've never really captured adequate information like the operating system, the firmware revisions, things like that, that order and, and tools can, can capture for you. So having that you know, nearly on the fly in real time offers you that, that visibility that you need to integrate that into your technology debt to support your argument for replacement. And, and, you know, this may be against, you know, what you would think I would say, but even if you don't have a tool or you, or you can't budget for a tool that will go out and get that information for you, it's not stopping you from on a PM cycle asking your technicians to collect a little bit of this information as they go along, uh, not to take away from their day where you have to go out and shut down a system to, to pull the serial number and then software versions and so forth. But as you're doing other work, try to gather the information, add it to the records. It, it's going to pay off in the long run, uh, and it's going to make that hill a lot harder to climb when, when you're asked for it. Max, Mac addresses is one of them for sure, right? So, so start capturing that. I, I don't care what, what technology you have. Um, there are some that, that just don't send it regularly. There are some that's hard to reconcile with tools. So if you're able to physically touch that during PMs and CMs and you've got a CMMS, I don't care what kind you have, start capturing this information because at some point you may change technologies and you're prepared. You're not having to go backwards when you're when you're looking to upgrade your technologies. All right. So moving from from chaos into visibility, and visibility is a is a is a you know is a new thing for many of us. You know, it's that real time asset discovery, and and as mentioned, you know, a, a passive nature where we're not actively scanning devices, we're passively fingerprinting and profiling. And we're giving you good quality data to understand your, your asset inventory. And, you know, this is, I'll, I'll kind of cross-reference this back to NIST. So that in one of the first slides, I showed that uh, the core functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework. One of the first things they ask for is, is, are you identifying your assets? Are you identifying software of your assets? You know, so again, as I mentioned, mapping back to a framework, you know, these visibility tools provide that. They're going to fingerprint and profile for you and provide that, that source of information. Um, they're also the act of monitoring the data flow analysis, some of the, the, the really good information that creates the efficiencies and the information that's used for lifecycle management is all available. I, I think what happens is, is we often get, get caught up in, in visibility and then don't know what to do with our visibility. And you know that's some of the outcome of this webinar is to kind of share with you what you can do, but the, it, it's data and it's extremely powerful, but you have to kind of correlate it, aggregate it, and put some context to it on based on your business goals and kind of the, the framework and roadmap I shared with you. Um, as Create a baseline on your visibility, right? You know, take a good look. What do I have? Where do I stand today? Um, you know, a snapshot in time, if you will. And then account for your assets. Account for the information you have. And then how does that change over time? How does that change three months from now or six months from now? Are you are, are new assets sneaking into your environment that you were unaware of? Because we all know what happens. Um, you know, order and any of these, these visibility tools collect that. They see that. So, you know, track that information. And, and now you can start to do some auditability, right? Some accountability on these things. Um, and then asset orchestration is achieved with data enrichment, meaning get more data. The, the more data, the more power you have in your hands. And so, you know, integrating your tools, integrating, uh, I'll call it the security tools, something you may not be involved with, but having those tools all integrated, there's business value there. And it allows you to have a good, clean picture of everything. 
and, and I guess I'll share the reason why I focus heavily on that is when we finally do get into risk management and we start talking about vulnerabilities here in a moment is vulnerability parsing and review is, is hard. And the more fidelity you have, the easier it becomes because you don't have to go to website to website to website and, and really nail down and, and drill down, is it applicable or not? You, you've got more data there to help you make decisions. And it kind of correlates again to lifecycle management and then link visibility into business goals. I, I've mentioned that, right? We've got visibility, what are we gonna do with it? And, and how do I achieve goals with my organizations? It, it shouldn't really be about me or you or, or, or clinical engineering or HTM. It should be about the organization. And I think that's, that's an important factor to keep in mind as you're trying to procure people or tools and, and kind of merge all this together. Yeah, and I think another thing we look at is what I'd like to talk about is like visibility 2.0. We know where we are today, you know, and you, you touch on this later, which is the MDS2s and, and asking for that information uh, from manufacturers and, and really requiring it for the purchase. Um, but we need to look at, at the efforts going forward for things like the Software Bill of Materials or SBOM. Um, there are groups out there that are pushing and, and there's actually legislation uh, going forward that manufacturers of medical devices need to provide an S uh, Software Bill of Materials, kind of a, a recipe of all the different pieces of software that go into the device. Um, and that's going to accelerate us to that next level of vulnerability management. We're not necessarily vul managing the device vulnerabilities as a, a manufacturer and a model, but down to the software that's installed on the devices. Um, and with the, the threats that are out there today, it's where we're going to have to get to be proficient at protecting these devices. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> now that we have visibility, we can kind of start to move into decision making and, and, and actions, right? So. Part of it is, is you know, aggregating and correlating your assets, understanding what do I have, what are my outdated operating systems, what firmware do I have, and just take a good hard look at that and capture that information. And then start to evaluate, well, you know, and I'll get into this in another slide, but what's what's updatable, right? What, what, what can I do to update? And if I have to update or if I can't update, what does it cost? Is it time material versus contract? Is it um, part of my contract? And then, you know, does it require a hardware change, right? We're all aware of this. We want to update an ultrasound. We want to update something. And it sounds great. It's only $10,000 for the software, but then it's another $50,000 because you got to replace the PC. At that point, you know, does it outweigh the risk, right? So we have to kind of break some of that down. Uh, review your manufacturers and make and models. What, what I see, again, is, is over time, a lot of organizations let anyone buy whatever they want. And, and yes, risk assessment should be done, but now start to profile. Well, why do I have 60, 70, 80 different make and manufacturers in my organization? And I'm not saying, you know, condense and, and, and get into one or two. Uh, we're all aware of what that could do for us, but, or what that could do to us. But, but the idea is, is you know, let's, let's, let's find what, what's the risk in certain assets? What, what is the life expectancy of certain make and models? And then let's create, a, I'll call it a standard. Right? So try to standardize your fleet. And as you standardize your fleet, it gives you greater capability and greater maturity to be able to make purchasing power and decisions with that vendor. Um, and then you again, you can kind of understand what are the security impl implications of that vendor. And that should help drive some of your decisions when it comes to making decisions around assets and capital equipment. And then kind of create an inventory or criticality matrix that you kind of see here in the diagram. And really the diagrams to represent of your current inventory, how much is already end of life, right? So the 31% there in the reddish orange, you're already almost $100 million in backlog of assets that are outdated and, and, and you, you know, over life expectancy. And then you can see there's, there's yellow and there's, there's others within this group. So we have to actually take this and start to plan for it. And again, data will help us plan for it. And the data that we typically rely on is you know, the useful life of it, right? What is AHA guidelines? What are some of the other guidelines that we look at? But now we have powerful information from, from you know, these visibility tools to provide us utilization information that can provide us, again, the operating system information. And what I'm seeing more and more of is the cyber team, the IS team is adamant that if you can't remediate something, if you can't remediate or mitigate a vulnerability, they want you to replace it. And again, it's hard to do when we're talking about a hundred thousand or, or a million dollar asset, and 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 you're you're backlogged. So taking you know the cybersecurity risk information and kind of organizing that with your life expectancy helps you build your business case of getting out of this backlog. I'm, I got to start replacing this equipment sooner. 
Um, and as we do replace this equipment, those vendors that we're looking at, what is their life cycle and what are their expectations and do they support the security initiatives that you have in place? And I think this comes back to that team effort uh, conversation you had earlier in that, you know, you need to be talking to your supply chain. You need to be talking to the people that are controlling that capital budget and making sure they're aware of, of the, the gaps and the holes that you have. Um, because it's it's that squeaky wheel gets the oil. If they don't know that there's a problem, uh, when it becomes an emergency, they're going to be, why didn't you tell me? Uh, and you don't want them to be the one standing there when, when they're asking why you didn't tell me I have a million dollar problem and I only have $100,000 left uh, in my budget this year. So make sure you're communicating this up and, and working as a team to get this resolved. Yeah. And this, this just kind of tacks on that a little bit more, right? So the impact of that. So the impact of your backlog and what's happening and, and for you and to support you and kind of your business case from a life cycle perspective is, is you have to look at the affordability of the cost perspective. So the kind of box here on the far left is, is, you know, it takes longer to repair. It takes longer to find parts. Supply chain's a nightmare right now with, with finding parts for some of these assets. So you can't realize some benefits in, in many cases. And then there's service related uh, risks associated with this, right? So the ability to use high quality services and parts, you know, it's, it's taking longer for these things. Um, again, you've got legacy systems. And then there's, of course, like the patient safety risk. But this is where, again, we can kind of focus on the cybersecurity risk. What, what, what do these risks, you know, bring in here to the organization? You know, there's impediments due to cybersecurity related risk. And if it's obsolete or non-supported hardware or software, you know, that, again, that supports you in trying to, you know, highlight the risk of these assets and highlight the risk and, and, and opportunity to try to start replacing these assets. And we really have to prioritize these. And again, I've, I've got a slide down here at the end that, that showcases that, right? It's a decision tree on, do I have to replace hardware? Yes or no? What does it cost? Does it outweigh the risk? Those kinds of factors. And that's all part of your, your life cycle management with your assets. All right, so if we look at life cycle from kind of an onboarding to decommissioning process, right? Onboarding and procurement is, is, is stop the bleed, right? It's, it's critical. And we have, you know, medical device security is a team sport in here again, because it is. I hear it repeatedly um, when, when it comes to procuring medical devices and assets is, I, it's supply chain, I, it's not, I don't do it. Well, okay, but that, that's no reason to just give up. Your, your supply chain folks have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. Again, tie it back to business goals, business objectives, things like that. So, you know, to be able to do secure onboarding and, and to do some of the things you'll see on the slide is you have to work with them. And I understand the more we work in these silos, the bigger the challenge. But if we just look the other way, you'll never overcome that challenge. And when you've got the equipment buyer and you've got yourself and you've got IS and you've got supply chain all speaking the same language of what you're trying to accomplish, magic does really happen things do occur and then you can start to vet and verify ben vendors based upon your security requirements and part of that is is you know doing those these risk assessments right the secure onboarding so we want to know what what's bringing what's coming into our organization but then when it does it kind of passed the sniff test right and now what are we going to do with it so we've got to add some controls to it we've got to quote unquote harden the device turn off ports turn off things but we also want to collect the CMMS attributes. We want to do that and make sure that we, we can put that in the CMMS or you know, just collect that information. we we'll grab the MDS2 information. And again, do a review and a risk assessment. Because the goal is, is this is an iterative process. You're going to onboard it. You're going to apply controls. And the reason why this is, to me, one of the most critical elements is, is when cybersecurity finally comes back to you and says, all right, I want you to start managing these vulnerabilities and look at this, What's going to happen is, is you're going to cross-reference a vulnerability to the asset you're onboarded. And if you securely onboarded it, the likelihood of that vulnerability exploiting you know, that asset is reduced because you hardened it. You closed all the doors. You made sure all the ports were turned off. You did all that great stuff. And so the vulnerability isn't a risk. So if you can't patch it, it's okay because the, you've, you've mitigated the risk so low that it's okay to move on, right? No need to spend more time on that vulnerability, move it out of the way, get it off the list and keep going. Um, and I've already hit on this, right? Engage supply chain. Uh, contract language is a big deal, right? Utilizing your visibility tool, understanding your fleet. The more you have a, a, I hate to call it a single fleet, but the more you have bigger 
uh, like manufacturers in your fleet, the greater your power is in your, in your contract language. So again, make sure you can include, well, are you gonna patch it for me? Are you gonna update it for me? Are you gonna manage the vulnerabilities of this asset? Because you are the buyer, you have opportunity to ask these. And if that vendor doesn't want to, then consider looking at other vendors and, and again, try to incorporate those in your contract language. And then again, defining some of the audit requirements. When you finally do onboard these things and you, you've con put controls and you've hardened your assets, what are you gonna do to make sure that's taken care of? You know, annual risk assessments, you know, reviewing that whatever you're doing is actually being performed. So again, you're auditing yourself. And one thing I'd like to add there is when you're when you're doing these pre-procurement type audits and stuff, don't don't die on the sword of you have to buy the most secure device. Um, it, clinically, it needs to meet the needs uh, of the patients and the physicians and the nurses. Um, so you have to make sure you're still taking that into account. Um, but what you can do is you can plan for the remediation ahead of time. Um, and that allows you to, when those devices do show up, already have a plan on how you're going to secure them, uh, even if it wasn't the best security choice, it was the best clinical choice, and you have to remember that. And, and I'm, I think Ben and I are both aware, we, we do know sometimes the physicians will drive what they want, and, and sometimes it, it, it's, you know, it is whatever they want. So again, we have to incorporate what we can into that contract language, maybe to support that initiative, if that's what the direction we're going. All right, so use technology to help identify vulnerabilities, risks, and, and threats and risks. And, and I say utilize technology because, as mentioned, some of you have already ran off and, 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 and grabbed yourself a, or hired yourself an HTM analyst or cybersecurity person. And a lot of that is manual. So utilizing the visibility tool, cross-referencing that to your, uh, your, your assets is a tremendous help. Uh, it really does create efficiencies. And so, you know, realizing that vulnerabilities are a risk to the business, they're a risk to patients, they're just a risk to your environment of care overall. You have to analyze that, you have to look at that, you have to be able to review that. And sometimes without program and process, what is it you're looking at and why are you looking at it? And, and that's the question I always ask one of these analysts or, or anyone who's trying to, to perform this function. And I, I, I get the, sh the shoulder shrug, I don't really know, right? I, I do what I'm told or I'm looking and, and here's what I'm evaluating and I, and I look at everything that's, that's 10 and up or, or nine and up from a, a CVSS score. So there's not a lot of processes there. Use the technology you have to support you and if you don't have technology again there, there's the these visibility tools can support that initiative and that's a, a good business case to support that uh, risk should be a driver for prioritization and actions right understanding well what is what is the risk to your organization what is the risk to patients what is the financial risk i know that's a challenge you know right the, how do i measure all that again a lot of your your visibility tools can provide that information for you use the data that's there to make those decisions you don't have to recalculate anything you know, get, continually assess and review your environment. You know, it's not a one and done. Vulnerabilities never stop, they're always there. So you have to understand that vulnerabilities aren't just CVEs and CVSS scores. They're outdated applications, you know, the unpatched operating systems and software, the open doors, the unnecessary ports, right? When we onboard an asset, many times these are just off the shelf. They're, out, you know, Ben mentioned that they're outdated already when they come in. So there's, there's elements to these that have never been closed down or removed or turned off, and, and that's what you have to do. Those are all vulnerabilities. Um, obsolete hardware, anomalies, and poor habits. Again, a lot of our devices, we just kind of turn on and, and let loose into the wild, and, and we didn't really tame the, the assets, meaning we didn't really tune them to do what they're only supposed to do. So we didn't say that this MRI workstation should only be a workstation. We enable web surfing and, and, and checking Gmail and things like that when we shouldn't. And again, this correlates to the, uh, the, the charter, the group, the team sport. You're probably making an assumption that cybersecurity is gonna do that. Well, no, if it's allowed on other workstations, okay, or if it's allowed on certain things, that's okay. But you know, it's a medical device. It's directly connected with cascading and aggregated risk to your MRI or, or whatever that, that clinical asset is. So it could fall in your purview and your domain. So that's something that you have to consider. I, mean, Ooh, I mentioned again, not all not all vulnerabilities are CVSS scores, right? And then right. you know, look at everything from a, a top-down and bottom-up approach. So review the risks, risks, things like that. And then you have to prioritize and triage these things. You can't just ad hoc. You don't just go straight at all tens. I'm chasing. It, it really is an aggregated effort and what you're trying to accomplish, and and really know where you're trying to go from there. 
And then know your know your remediation and mitigation options, and, and we'll briefly cover that here in a moment. Man, I, I read a little bit of feedback there. I'm not really sure where that's coming from, but uh, the one thing I, I didn't see on here was was leveraging size and, and scale, and it's not for everybody. Um, but if you're a multi-system organization, if you have multiple facilities, don't have multiple people chasing the same vulnerability. Um, you know, parse those out. Have somebody that's organizing them and, and working with the different technicians. And then once you have a solution, push that out to everybody. Um, it, you don't want to reinvent the wheel with this stuff. You want to you want to use the resources you have efficiently. Um, and I think that's something that gets missed sometimes. Thank you, Ben. All right, so cyber risk management is part of life cycle management, right? So you have to consistently identify risk. And when I say this, I don't mean you know clinical risk. I'm not referring to the regulatory piece and, and, and the joint commission things that everyone's associating this with. I mean a totally separate risk, a cybersecurity risk. Um, and that's what I try to teach a lot of customers and, and, and clients is, all right, yes, you have that risk, but now the cyber risk is also important and you have to focus on this as well. And that's what you know this defines, right? Is identify it, you know, perform your assessment, have some sort of response or mitigation in place, and then you know, apply your controls, but you're not done. You still have to monitor. And this is why I, I, I share with a lot of customers too, is you, 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 it's not a one and done, you do your assessment, you still have to come back and assess on a regular basis. Is my risk changing over time? Your environment changes, vulnerabilities change, things change, so you have to consistently address and review risk. And again, you know, being able to do that, it really aligns well with these visibility tools. They really do help you in profiling and, and, and framing up this risk process, so it makes it so much more efficient. And as you track this, Again, associate this with your technology debt to support you in, in capital equipment replacement. Anything to add, Ben? I'm, I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit, so we've got about 10 minutes uh, sure. to let you get through. Yeah, and, and you know, I won't get into too much details here, but uh, assessing risks gotta follow a process. And, and this is where a lot of organizations also struggle, right? So someone has to define this this bluish green line here. And, and this line really does say, you know, right, this is our risk threshold. This is our appetite. And, and we need to define, you know, why chase anything down here, right? I hate to say why, but don't focus that as a priority. Focus up here. You've got this information up here. You've got critical. You know, these have to be a priority. And that's really what you want to focus on. Once you manage that risk and those assets, you can move below that line on that threshold. Um, and, and then you're going to turn into that more proactive approach versus reactive. So you know, everything up here in, in the top half is more reactive. And what you see on the left-hand side really is focusing on how, um, how to do this. And, 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 you know, we can cover that in a whole other webinar. Um, but the only thing I really want to add to this is you have to define criticality and sensitivity of your assets. And meaning which ones are most critical to your organization, which ones are not. You know, which ones are the most sensitive to uh, if, if a negative or an event occurred, which ones are the most sensitive to that? And I'll be honest, nursing probably already assumes you, you've got something in place. Do you have your contingency? Do you know this? And you can't make assumptions. A, a documented process and, again, utilizing information from these IOMT tools or, or order, you know, can help you define that and then cross-reference that to what, what nursing's telling you, right? Well, yes, we all know, you know CT and MRI and these, these kinds of assets are critical and sensitive, but are all of them, right? Is the one over in the ortho clinic that's only used three times a week really that critical? Um, it's one of those things, yes, it's measurable. We can see some data and we can help determine that. And again, that's helped prioritize some of the risk here that we have. Uh, the remediation and mitigation options is, is part of all of this, right? So you've identified risk, you've got, elements that you need to address, and now you need to remediate and or mitigate. And what I mean by that is remediate really removes the risk. I hate to say completely, but if it's like a vulnerability, you've patched that asset, which has closed that and prevented you from exploiting that vulnerability. Mitigation is more along the lines of you've reduced the risk or the likelihood so much that the risk is so low that you've mitigated the risk. So patches and updates typically remediate a, a vulnerability or a risk. Your configuration changes are, are, are more of a mitigation option where 
uh, there's a vulnerability or, or an open door, and if you change that configuration, the likelihood is reduced enough where the risk is lower. The compensating controls, uh, and this may again fall out of our domain a little bit, but this is why you want to have stakeholder support. This is why you want to have sponsorship because there's a lot of assumption that you're going to be able to patch a good portion of your devices and you can't. So what is the next best steps? How do we reduce organizational risk? And it's with uh, compensating controls. So the network access control, the network segmentation, the other mechanisms, the, the next generation firewalls, I'll call them. These can be utilized with your medical equipment. And you know, I'll let Ben talk to that here in a moment, a little more on that as, as there's, there's integrations, there's security tools that take your information or take asset information and can help make those actionable decisions. And then ultimately there's, there's risk acceptance, right? So we accept the risk. There's nothing we can do about it. We don't wanna put forth the effort to reduce the risk. So we're just going to accept it. And whoever accepts it is essentially accountable for that risk. And, and that's sometimes one of those things where is it nursing, is it you, HTM, or is it cyber? And that stuff has to be defined. Ben, any more to add on, on competent controls? Um, no, I, I'll, I'll make it quick. You know, we, everybody hears the, the the buzzword zero trust and things like that, and and it's it's kind of that 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 black hole where everything gets thrown into it, and or we've tried it and we took the piece of equipment down, and we spent weekends there trying to make it uh, to implement the policy properly. Um, it can be achieved. Um, you know, protecting devices using network access control is an achievable event. But you have to work together, and I, and I know we've, we're, we're driving this home so many times. But it, it is a combination of, of IT, security, network services, and HTM that makes the pro, a program like that successful. And, and we just can't say it enough. Very good. All right. One of the last few things here is uh, don't forget about decommissioning your assets, right? So securely sanitizing your devices, uh, utilizing frameworks. So the NIST 800-88, um, it, it gives you a full guideline on what you're trying to accomplish and how to do it, or how to wipe, purge, or clear you know, the information on these assets. And there should be some clear understanding of what you're trying to accomplish, right? And, and that kind of boils down to this, this next bullet here of, well, are we disposing of it? Are we repurposing it? Are we reselling it, donating, savaging it? Whatever are we doing with it? So Yes, there's variations to this, and there's actually different what I'll call uh, data classifications. And if you have a data classification policy, well, the data that's on this asset is it publicly known data? Is it private? Is it protected health information? And you can map over a secure sanitization method to your data classification policy, meaning it prevents you from completely drilling holes in every single hard drive, wiping the you know the, the asset useless, and then you can't resell it. So I know that's a question everyone asks. Um, yes, you know, continue on, document your processes. So if you're if you're if you're drilling hard drives, whatever it is you're doing, try to follow these standards. That that DoD or the NIST standard. Yes, physical destruction is part of it. Is one of them. Um, now the easier thing might just to remove the hard drive and go take it to the ID depart IT department and, and dump it in a dumpster, and they take care of it. But something to keep in mind is working with them is. Do you need a chain of custody? Do you need to document something? Uh, so for a lot of customers, we, we work and talk about proof. Take a picture, fill out the form, attach it to the work order, retire the asset, boom, it's done and it's gone. That way, if your privacy officer or anyone wants to ask, you've, you've, you've taken care of it. And so that's that's kind of part of that chain of custody. But these are elements that, that I share and there's workflows associated with this. And this NIST framework does help you kind of identify that workflow. All right, and so creating efficiencies with the data, you know, the IOMT tools here that we're, we're discussing and, and a lot of the, the lifecycle management here is, is once you get all these elements in place, right, you have processes, you've got your people, you've got everything defined, uh, you're, you're going to realize the efficiencies. It's not as hard to do in year two and year three. The roles have to be clearly defined. W without it, it really is a, an ad hoc process. People are confused, and this is why people leave too. They're not really sure what they're supposed to do. You hired them and they're doing a job, but now they're like, well, what else is there to do, right? I don't know. So you have to clearly define those. Um, technology has to be implemented properly, right? The technologies as far as like order and, and, and these, these IOMT visibility tools and your CMMSs and any other tools you're using and technology you're using have to be properly implemented. 
uh, automation orchestration between your products is, is it really creates efficiency. So being able to have that automation amongst tools, it, it's a higher level of maturity and you can't get there until you meet the basic foundational functions. The, you know, the, the nice elements to this and, and really where you start to get some ROI is the tracking utilization of your assets, helping you drive some decision-making capabilities. We've, we've talked about you know, your, your assets, we've talked about your technology debt, kind of associating utilization with that. And then your location tracking. So if you can have technicians essentially have location information and that's in the CMMS and that's updated real time, that you, know, you can go find those assets much quicker than, than hitting a floor. And it's not the exact same as RTLS, but it, it complements RTLS to the degree that you can really narrow down where these assets are. All right, so you know, just last couple of slides here. Uh, supporting lifecycle management and, and to the technology debt here is, is you know, have a, a risk exception, exception and acceptance process, right? Understand what you're trying to accomplish with your technology debt. Um, utilize that to help you with your tech and, and how you're going to replace it or how you're going to capital plan with it. Uh, a data-driven approach, right? So again, you're utilizing your asset information from your visibility tool. Uh, you're going to incorporate that information into your cyber risk. And that's going to help drive some of the decisions to replace if, replace your infrastructure, replace your assets. And then prioritize what you can't replace. So as mentioned, all right, if I can't replace it, can I, do I have OPEX dollars, right? Do I, you know, I'm looking at capital equipment now, if I can utilize um, operations dollars, can I just uh, update for now? Can I go ahead and replace the, the software and or the hardware to get me to that next revision just to keep it for the next three years? while I try to get capital equipment plan or capital equipment dollars. Uh, evaluate other solutions. What are the compens other compensating controls? You know, we talked about cyber compensating controls, but what are your, your technology debt compensating controls? What can I do with that um, to support the initiative here? And I, I, next slide will kind of cover that. Uh, and then investments. You, your investments in any kind of mitigation or compensating controls should never outweigh the risks. Otherwise, you're just you're wasting money, time, and effort. So if your option is, is you know, to, to apply a bunch of next generation firewalls to a couple of assets and, and those things cost more than the assets themselves, well, your, your mitigation controls are outweigh the cost and, and the risk of those assets. So you have to balance that to some degree. Um, you can't just throw money at everything. And, and if it's not capital dollars, just throw a bunch of operations dollars at everything. So there's a healthy balance there. All right, and we are coming up against time. So the thing we really want to focus too on is when it comes to your technology debt and it comes to capital equipment mm -hmm. planning and replacing is, is, you know, again, utilizing visibility tools, seeing that you have obsolete operating systems and, and create that decision tree. And, and that's kind of what this is to highlight, right? Is this, what are my upgrade options? Does it require hardware? Yes or no. All right, what are my alternate solutions? You know, can I move this to a different department? Can I repurpose this? and then put some compensating controls or some security controls around it. Um, and, and then, or I can't do anything and I have to accept risk. And, and maybe there's something that the cybersecurity team can, can work with me on. And, and this kind of all helps with, with that assessment process to help you get into the next stages of, of capital equipment planning. And just another decision tree or workflow, you know, this was a use case with an example. And, and the top left there, you've got a couple, what, 8,000 8, or so, you know, obsolete operating systems, right? Not achievable or obtainable really with boots on the ground frontline staff. Uh, optimally uh, attainable with visibility tools to provide you that information. And that's really where a lot of that value comes in for you. And then you can start to look at, all right, what am I going to do with my assets? What, <laughs> what updates can I perform with these assets? And then what's the logic behind it, right? And associate some of the, the logic with that. So you kind of see here in this diagram is, is I'm looking at accepting the risk of nearly 3,000 assets. It's about $100 million in replacement. Uh, if I upgrade the OS alone, I don't have any that I can just upgrade the operating system. So then I kind of move into my alternate solutions here and start to look around hardware and software replacement. And of the 8,000 I have here in this, this image, uh, 2,500 or so roughly, you know, could be possibly updated, but it would cost me about 93 million, right? So I may not be able to replace the asset, but I can look at replacing hardware and software on many of these for about $100 million. So these are just options. And, and again, utilizing utilization data to help support this is, is really critical. So I'll pause there since I had to rush through that one. And 
Uh, Jamie, we have any questions from the audience? We do, Matt. We have a couple that came in, so I'm just going to jump right into it, but you're welcome to submit additional questions if you would like. Uh, first attendee has asked, has new equipment been easier to keep secure than older equipment? Any changes seen? I, I think uh, I'll answer start first. I'll let Ben hit on that. Yes, but it is also manufacturer dependent. Uh, I think some manufacturers are starting to play nice. They're starting to incorporate controls. They're starting to allow you to make changes to the device and not keep you locked out of the device. So yes, to some degree, um, but then there's also older devices that you, you can utilize what I'll call that defense in depth approach, where you can stack controls if you already have them available, it doesn't make it as hard. If you don't have them available, yes, it's a little more challenging, but um, I don't know, Ben, your, your perspective? Yeah, you took the first few words right out of my mouth. It really depends on the manufacturer, but, but going back to some of your other points is leverage your contracting to make it so that they have to keep these systems up to date. It should be part of the purchasing agreement that they have a plan for the next eight to 10 years for that device and that they are going to support op updating the operating systems and so forth and, and put it in the contract so that they, they don't have anywhere to go with it. Uh, so it's as much as the purchasers as it is the vendors that need to keep everybody honest. Fair enough. Uh, another attendee has submitted a question that reads, we find software version management interesting as the establishment of easier and later versions, i.e. 11.2.5 SP2. The first is alphanumerically easier, but actually later. Do you have familiar issues? Matt? Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. So, so seeing the, the information from an asset, well, usually the visibility tools can pick that information up and profile that for you and then categorize it. So you can take a group of, if, let's just for the sake of the conversation, EKGs, if they're all you know, a certain make and manufacturer model, but they have different firmware or revision numbers, you know, these platforms can see that and you'll, you'll be able to see that in a dashboard. Now to track that in a CMMS, that's an absolute nightmare, right? When you're trying to do that manually, because if you have 50 to 100 to 200 of them, that's a challenge. And that changes as you flash you know, hardware or, or you send in for repair and things like that. But you know, tools like order allow you to audit that information. So I think that was kind of the answer to the question. I don't know, um, Ben, do you have any insights? Yeah, I think it's also more like the manufacturer's naming convention on the software revisions and, and the, the sometimes lack of logic associated with them where where the, the the previous version isn't numerically superior to the one that you just you know the the, the most recent one um, and, and another area where I found this very difficult was was also managing revisions on systems that are that are dependent on different revisions so if you have a full patient monitoring system um, you know knowing that hey they say you need to upgrade this monitor but the, the subsystems that the monitor connects to also have to be upgraded um, was also a very difficult uh, revision management uh, that, that had to you know there's just no great solution for it. Ah, very good. All right guys one last question for the 60 minute allotted time. Uh, how do I request or get resources to help create a medical device security program? Uh, um, a lot of the resourcing takes place from the elements we talked about. So create your processes, create, you know, tracking your efforts. Uh, we talk about work orders, we talk about your CMS. If you're doing work in, in the visibility tool and you're doing things on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, create the work order, track your time, track your efforts, code it properly. And over time, as you see that, that gradual increase, you know, that helps you leverage the time, effort, and, and number of work orders associated with your cybersecurity efforts. So that, and if, if cybersecurity is sending you emails asking you, can you do this, can you do this, can you do this, you must track that. And again, since our, our bread and butter and, and, and HTM is, is our CMMS, we have to live out of that. And that's what we want to try to track our best. And, and many of our CMSs may not be capable, um, but that's, an, again, another technology that, that we got to look at pulling out of. Uh, to be able to track those efforts. And that really helps you identify what is the level of effort needed for the task at hand 
and then how many resources would I need for that? So yes, there's there's more calculations to it, but starting the foundation of tracking it will support what you're doing versus just going to leadership and saying, well, I need two FTEs. Well, why? Here's why. Here's what we're doing. Here's how we're doing it, and here's how much time it's taking. And I, you know, I can't complete PMs or CMs if cyber's always asking me to remediate these vulnerabilities. And I would just 10 seconds say, ask for help. Um, within the organization, ask your IT resources for help and document that as well so that when they say, hey, have you looked at what internal resources we have? You can say, yes, we've exhausted those options. And then be able to reach out to something like First Health Advisors, who's an expert in the field, uh, and say, hey, we need help. We need you to help us start our people and processes. And then we need you to not own the process anymore. You need to turn it over to us and let us run with it. Uh, it's a very powerful thing with a partner. Good. Thank you, Ben. Fantastic, guys. Thank, thanks to both of you for such a great presentation today. Again, I want to encourage all of the attendees to visit today's sponsor's website. You can learn more about ORDER by going to ordr.net, order.net. Quick reminder to all of the attendees that CE Certificate Survey is going to come to your inbox via email in one hour from right now. The survey is going to be emailed. You must complete it to obtain your certificate. And if you have any issues working through this, please reach out to us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We're going to be back next week and every Wednesday through August and September for another live webinar. Be sure to visit webinarwednesday.live to see our upcoming calendar go ahead and register for free for the webinars that you'd like to attend. All right, Tech Nation, make it a great day, and we'll see you back next week.